Well, today I want to uh, talk about a, uh, a uh, basic doctrine, and that doctrine is the Sabbath day. And uh, the title of my message is The Sabbath, a Vital Doctrine of the Church. A Vital Doctrine of the Church. And I hope to show you today that it is a vital doc doc doctrine of the church and uh, some of the benefits that we get from uh, keeping the Sabbath, the Sabbath day. <clears throat> you know, modern Christianity has more or less abandoned the, the Sabbath. They say, they have this saying, as long as you, uh, you, as long as you uh, set aside one day a week for God, it doesn't make any difference. I mean, really, I mean, <laughs> as long as you love God, you're connected to God, it doesn't make any difference. You could be Sunday or any other day, actually, I guess. <clears throat> but is that true? No, it isn't true. Um, the early church had the same problem. Early on, the early church was questioning whether or not they should keep Saturday the Sabbath because that was the Jews' day. And, uh, and they they said if you keep the the seventh day sabbath then you're uh, you're judaizing and you're trying to earn your salvation but uh, that's not true either anyway today i want to uh, show you that keeping the sabbath is a vital uh, part of worshiping god I want to show you uh, to begin uh, just what was happening back in the first century. So if you will turn to uh, Jude, Jude 1. No, Jude was the physical brother of Jesus. Uh, I guess technically you call him a half brother because uh, he had different fathers. So Jude 1, and let's read verse 3. It says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which is once, once for all delivered to the saints. Now, you know, Mr. Pardian talked about Greek words and... Uh, I would like to say a little bit about this word. I, I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, look up the pronunciation, all that. But the, the, the phrase content earnestly is one word. Well, actually, I, I guess I did look up the word, but it was, it was so long, I didn't want to try to pronounce it. But embedded in the word is, the, is our word agonize. It, it's, uh, it has about five syllables, and right, right in the middle of it is ag agonize and uh, and uh, historians say that word is used mainly to uh, to talk about those who are participated to participated in the Greek games the, they call it the Olymp Olympiad and uh, what it means it means to strive with all absolutely all of your being all of your being and and that's what that's what athletes who are at the top of their game do. They they put out all their effort. They they they, they say they talk about leaving it on the field. They they strive as much as they can to win that event. And, and so, so that's what that word there means: contend earnestly, diligently to. Uh, <clears throat> For the faith once delivered. Then in verse 4 it says this. For certain men have crept in unnoticed. Who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men. Who turned the grace of our God into lewdness. And denied the only Lord God and, and our Lord Jesus Christ. So. Even in the, now, when was this written? That was, this was written about uh, some, somewhere between 60 and 80 A.D., very early in the church. Church was 
what? The church was uh, 20, 30 uh, years old, and already, already they were, they were saying, well, what about this Sabbath? Do we really need to keep that Sabbath? I mean, <laughs> I mean, uh, we know the, the, the Sabbath is basically for the Jews, so maybe we ought to think about it. And, and they did. They eventually, uh, they eventually uh, abandoned the Sabbath. What did I do? Oh, I turned over two pages. I didn't see them. I'm really going fast here. Okay, this is a little, a little better here. In 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 regard to that that uh, what was happening in early church, the uh, the um, compromising and so on. It, Second Thessalonians 2 7, you don't need to turn that, I'm just going to quote one line from it. It says, The mystery of iniquity already works. So there you are in early first century, it says, The iniquity already works. So already there were people in the church that were doubting what the apostles were teaching them. So one of the first things that they forgot they abandoned was the Sabbath. And what happens when you forget the Sabbath? Well, Psalms 1, 111 verse 10 says this. Partially, I'm just, I'm just bringing out a phrase. It says, a good understanding have all those who do his commandments. And I wondered about that statement. What does that mean? I think it means two things. When you keep the commandments, God sees and he gives you more understanding. You understand things that others just don't understand. And uh, of course, you know, when you keep the commandments, that, that naturally puts your nose into the Bible to read more about the commandments and learn more about them. So you, so you study more. So I think that's a twofold situation there. Years ago, uh, there was a fellow in the, the SDA church called uh, Bakioki, uh, Samuel Bakioki, and uh, he was a really good researcher. And uh, he researched the Sabbath, the observance of the Sabbath, just over and over, and, and he wrote one thick book about that and, and a lot of us in the church read that book it's a very good book uh, I was on a forum years ago and uh, it was you know worldwide church of God people and you know some that were you know thinking about leaving and all of that and all of a sudden I saw his his name it, you know it, it, we had no video it was just uh, you, you know uh, audio and uh, his name popped up and, and he stayed there for a while but it, I don't know for some reason he left I don't know why but anyway he was he was a brilliant man and and I and I think he understood what he did because he was a Sabbath keeper he didn't keep the holy days and he didn't do a lot of other things that we do but he kept the Sabbath, and so he had understanding that others did, don't have. Well, I have four points today that I want to give you. Uh, <clears throat> point one is the Sabbath reminds us of creation and the Creator. And I'm going to read the uh, Exodus 20, verse 8, which is the, the Sabbath command. If you want to turn there and read along with me, you may. Exodus 20, verse 8. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. You shall do no work, you nor your son or daughter or male servant or female servant, nor cattle a stranger within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And, the, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day 
and hallowed it. You know, that's, that's pretty plain. He rested the seventh day and hallowed it. Have you ever wondered it, when you read that, it says, remember the Sabbath day. Well, when the Israelites heard that, you know, they hadn't been keeping the Sabbath day. And they, and they might say, what do you mean, remember the Sabbath day? We, we don't know anything about a Sabbath day. How, how am I supposed to remember something I don't know much about? And, uh, well, I think one of the reasons is the Sabbath highlights the creation. And so we're supposed to remember God keeping the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day that Almighty God kept. And uh, so when we keep the Sabbath, it reminds us of creation. And uh, so I don't think we should uh, forget that. Let's, let's turn to Romans, uh, Romans 1. And, and I want to read verses 18 through 25. If you'd like to turn there and read along with me, Romans 1, <clears throat> verse 18. Of course, this was to the church in Rome, a Gentile church, and uh, he was emphasizing creation to them. Romans 1, verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness and uh, that was taking place even in the first century suppress the truth they uh, you know they said you don't need to keep the sabbath uh, one day is good as another and so they're they're suppressing the truth verse 19 because what may be known of god is manifest in them for god has shown it to them well, the word them is uh, the creation. <laughs> For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even the eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And, and that's true. You can look at creation and see how perfectly it's designed. It's so perfect. It's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, for example, what would happen if the earth was a little bit bigger than it is now? Let's say it increased it by size in 20%. Well, one thing would happen is you'd weigh a whole lot more than you do now. <laughs> you'd weigh 20% more than you do now. But if it's doubled in size, you'd, you know, if you weigh 200 pounds, so now you'd weigh 400. Think of that, what would do to your legs if you weighed 400 pounds? <laughs> anyway, it's, it's designed perfectly. It, it's a perfect size. And of course, it's tilted 23 and a half degrees. And that's the perfect tilt for the sun to sunlight to spread across the globe like it should. It has a perfect amount of water, 70% uh, water and 30 percent land that's perfect because the water is there to to water the the land and it, it's perfect and it's saying that this is evident you know scientists know that i mean they they can tell you all of that that stuff so it says they were they are without excuse because although they knew god they did not glorify him as god nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And if you've heard any of these so-called brilliant men talk about, you know, mainly agnostics and atheists, you know, they think they're brilliant, but they're, like the Bible says, they're, they're really fools. And change the glory of the in, in, incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, birds and four-footed four animals and creeping things. 
which they like to eat and so on. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. We see that today. Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature. And that word could be translated creation, better translation actually. And served the creation rather than the creator who is blessed forever. And it says, Amen. So, people are, with, are without excuse when they deny that there is a God. They, they, should, they, should, they can clearly look at, at creation and prove there is a God. Next point I would like to emphasize is the Sabbath reminds us of the 7,000 year plan of God. When I first came into the church, I thought Mr. Armstrong made that up. I thought, I don't know about this 7,000 year thing. <laughs> Where'd you get that? Well, actually the early church knew, knew about the 7,000 year plan. I wanna read you just a little bit from a, a fellow by the name of Irenaeus. Uh, Irenaeus was a, a, a writer, historian, and he, Irenaeus was a uh, disciple of Polycarp, and Polycarp was a disciple of John. So John was faithful throughout his life. He didn't, he didn't vary at all. But Irenaeus, uh, although he was really admired uh, Polycarp, because, because he admired, because he was a disciple of John, he uh, he eventually uh, went off the deep end and forgot everything and went went with the uh, the, the, the interlopers who, who changed everything. But Carly, Polycarp didn't. As far as we know, Polycarp was faithful to the end, and uh, Polycarp actually had, went to Rome to argue about the Passover. He said the Passover is on the fourteenth. And uh, Rome said, eh, it make a difference. <laughs> but he argued with the, with the Pope, but not the Pope. The, yeah, I guess, it was, I, I don't know if it was the Pope. But anyway, he argued with somebody at Rome about the, the Passover. Anyway, here's what Irenaeus, Irenaeus, I used to call Irenaeus Irenaeus, and some people do. But, the, but I hear scholars say Irenaeus is the proper pronunciation. It says, for, here's what he wrote. For in many days as the world was made, in so many thousand years shall it be concluded. And for this reason, the scripture says, thus the heavens and the earth were finished in all their adornment. And God brought to a conclusion upon the sixth day the works that he made. And God rested upon the seventh day from all his works. This is an account of things formerly created, still quoting Irenaeus, as also it is a prophecy of what is to come, for the day of the, for a day the day of the Lord is a thousand years, and in six days created word created things were completed. It is evident, therefore, that they will come to an end at the six thousand year, and then it gives it, it, that was in a document called against. Heresies by Irenaeus. So they 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 understood that man was allotted six thousand years, and then the, the end of the man's age would come, and then would go into the millennium. They understood that, and uh, I could read you. I think I'll skip some of this because I, I want to read you a little more about that, but. Uh, there are other thing, other people who uh, wrote about the same thing. Uh, for example, there's a, uh, a there's a document called the Epistle of Barnabas, and it's not part of the Bible, but it was a, a writing that was extant, and he, he he basically said the same thing in a little different words. Even the Babylonian Talmud, which the Jews uh, take care of. 
talks about the 7,000 year plan of God. So that was well known that, uh, you know, God has a plan and, and man is going to be able to uh, do his thing and we're seeing him do his thing and messing everything up. And then, then we're going to have the millennium and learn how to really, how man should be ruled. So the Sabbath points to that. The, the Sabbath is a is a symbolic of that 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 plan, that seven thousand year plan. But by contrast, does Sunday point to anything? Not really. It doesn't, point, it doesn't point to nothing. It's the first day of the week. It's not. It's not significant in, in, with the Jews or with God. Point three is this. The Sabbath teaches us of God's never-ending love for us and all mankind. And um, what I would like to do at this point is to point you to uh, Psalm 92. And uh, the Psalms are divided into uh, four books, four, four sections. I guess you'd call it books. And uh, the fourth section uh, started in Psalm 90. And uh, it's interesting to me that there's a, there's a psalm. There's only one psalm that's called this, a psalm for the Sabbath. And that's Psalm 92. It's the only psalm that's listed that way, a, a psalm for the Sabbath. And I thought it was interesting that the, the Psalms are divided into four books, and uh, well, I don't know if it's significant or not, but uh, the fourth command is a Sabbath command, and the and the fourth book of the Psalms is the uh, is a fourth book, and uh, right near the beginning is this Psalm for the Sabbath. So I'd like to read uh, Psalm ninety-two. Psalm 92 says, a psalm, a psalm, a song of the Sabbath day. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to his name, O Most High. And uh, if, if you remember, on the Sabbath day, in Sabbath services, we always praise God, don't we? And in some way or form, whether it's singing or in messages or whatever, we praise God. Even in the opening prayer, Many praise God. Verse 2, to, to declare his loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night on an instrument of ten strings, on the lute and on the harp with harmonious sound. We always have music, Sabbath, always, 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 don't we? And uh, God loved music. For you, Lord, have made me glad through your work. I will triumph in the works of your hand. They're sort of pointing to creation again. Verse 5, O Lord, how great are your works. Your thoughts are very deep. Again, about creation. A senseless man does not know, nor does a fool understand this. When the wicked spring up like grass, and when all workers of iniquity flourish, is it that they may be destroyed forever? Now, I read that as a question. It's not a question. It is that they may be destroyed forever. For you, Lord, are on high forevermore. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. You know, as you read this, you can think, uh, you know, some of these thoughts we actually do on the Sabbath day in messages and so on. But my horn you have exalted like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. And uh, it sort of relates to us. I mean, we, we're special in God's eyes, believe it or not. Even, with, even, uh, even what we consider ourselves, God uh, looks at us very favorably. My eye also has seen my desire in my enemies. My ears hear my desire in the wicked who rise up against me. Uh, 
The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree and shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Uh, some of the metaphors that God is fond of using. Those who are planted in the house of God of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. So what does it mean, planted in the house of the Lord? Right here. Today, the house of the Lord is right here. And uh, you people are planted here like you should be. That's a wonderful thing, really. What does it mean they shall flourish in the courts of our God? I don't really know what that means, but, <laughs> but I mean, uh, it does say that we will judge angels, and so that's going to be us. Perhaps that's what it means. They shall, they shall still, still bear fruit in, fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. To declare the Lord is upright, he is my rock, there is no unrighteousness in him. So there you have the, uh, the song for the Sabbath, or the psalm for the Sabbath. Well, I'm kind of running out of time here, even though I haven't said a whole lot. <clears throat> My next point is, <clears throat> is this, the Sabbath reminds us there's something beyond. And it does. <clears throat> it reminds us that um, after man's 6,000 years, there's going to be something bigger and better and greater and more wonderful than we have ever imagined. <clears throat> and the millennium is not just the millennium. It's the millennium and beyond. The millennium is, is really just a beginning. You know, you uh, compare that with what uh, regular Christianity thinks, and they, they don't really know what's going to happen, uh, maybe floating on a cloud and playing a harp or whatever. I mean, there, there, there is no plan. I mean... I think the Catholics have a phrase called the beatific vision, whatever that is. And <laughs> but I mean, there's no real plan, and we have a plan. We're going to we're going to be in the family of God, and we're going to help God teach others how wonderful God is. Let's turn. Um, to Hebrews uh, 4, and we'll read a few, ver few verses there. <clears throat> you know, some, some think the uh, Sabbath ended when the, when the Christ came and, and offered himself. They think the Sabbath was over. But uh, if you read Hebrews Carefully, uh, you see that it's not. So let's read uh, he Hebrews 4, beginning in verse 1. It says, Therefore, since the promise remains of entering his rest, and I emphasize the word rest because he's going to use the word rest over and over in this section. Let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For who have believed for we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said, so I swear in my wrath they shall not enter my rest, although the works are finished from the foundation of the world. For if he had spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place they shall not enter my rest, since therefore, therefore remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not because of disobedience. Again, he designates a certain day, saying, And David, today, after such a day as it has been said, Today, if you will hear your voice, do not harden your hearts. And then verse 8 says, For Joshua, if Joshua had given them rest, 
then he would not have afterward have spoken of another day. Therefore, there, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. So basically that's talking about the millennium, isn't it? it I mean, it sounds like all of it is talking about the millennium because it says, you know, when uh, Joshua led them into the uh, promised land, they, uh, they entered a rest but uh, it wasn't it wasn't the the best rest because you know it it eventually failed. So he's talking basically about the the uh, millennium. However, there is a translational problem here, which uh, you cannot tell from the English. the uh, The word rest is a uh, is a Greek word kataposis, and uh, you might understand that kataposis is related to the English word pause. The, it, the word pause comes from there, and it means, means to rest. That's what it means. But in verse 9, it says, There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. That word rest there is a completely different word. It's the word sabbatismos. Sabbatismos. And it's only used once in the entire Bible. It's not used in the Septuagint. It, you know, the Septuagint is written in Greek. It's not used there. But uh, people do know what it means. They, they know it means a keeping of a Sabbath. And uh, let me read you what the Anchor Bible says about this word. Regarding the meaning of Sabbatismos, the word Sabbath rest translate the Greek noun Sabbatismos, a unique word in the New Testament. This term appears in Plutarch, and of course I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about Plutarch, for Sabbath observance, and in four post-canonial Christian writings. In other words, Christian writings after the first century uh, this word is used four times. Every time it's used for the seventh day Sabbath celebration. Every time, that's what it means. And uh, I mentioned uh, Bakayoki before, and uh, he also did a lot of research on that word, and he verifies that that's absolutely true. That that's what the word means. But you never know that reading verse 9 in the King James or hardly any other translation. So I wanted to, I looked up some other translations and I uh, uh, see I'm missing one. I wanted to show you there are several translations which. Uh, hmm. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Bible in basic English says, so there's, there is still a Sabbath keeping for the people of God. That's what it says. There is a Sabbath keeping for the children of God. What this is saying is the Sabbath is still relevant. The Sabbath is still here. The Sabbath is to be kept. The uh, Jewish New Testament says, so there remains a Sabbath keeping for God's people. The uh, Douay Reims, you know, do you know what the Douay Reims is? It's a Catholic Bible. Here's what it says. There remains therefore a day of rest for the people of God. A day of rest, not a millennial rest, a day of rest. And also the Wycliffe Bible. The Wycliffe Bible was written in about 1380. Uh, 150 years before the King James was written. Here's what Wycliffe says. Therefore the Sabbath is left to the people of God. So Wycliffe knew that the Sabbath was to be kept. So it's, it's pretty obvious that um, it is known, and it's, it's in the scriptures, Hebrews 9.4 says, there remains a Sabbath keeping for the children, for the people of God. 
So I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm out of time. Let me uh, summarize what I've, what I've said today. Number one, the Sabbath reminds us of creation and the Creator. Number two, the Sabbath reveals God's 7,000 year plan. Three, it reminds us of God's incredible love for us. <clears throat> Actually, the whole creation reminds us of that. I mean, the, he, he, he designed the earth perfectly for us to live on it. Number four, it points us to something greater in the future. And uh, <clears throat> I didn't develop it, but I, there is a, another point that I really could include in that the Sabbath is a sign. It says, what is it? Uh, Exodus 31, 13 says, God said to Israel, it is a sign. The Sabbath is a sign throughout your generations. And then Galatians 6 says, we are the, the Israel of God. So if the, if the Sabbath was a sign for the Jews, Jewish nation, and we are the Israel of God, then it's a sign for us as well. And uh, I didn't take time to develop that, but that's a truism as well.